Okay, thank you. Right. Our next contestant is from the School of Māori and Pacific Development, Roger Lewis. My supervisors told them not to thank me. Told me not to thank them. Uh, however, I do need to acknowledge some people. To a tahi me wihi ki e hua na 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 me akatoi hanga ki a tahi hu a na mana ki tanga ki ronga ki to tato kini to hate it. O te ra tato e tau ni ko tu harimini te tau tu kiaho o te ra te kaupapa te na kuto te na kuto huri no te na tato katoa. Go back with me, if you will, to the opening ceremony of the Rugby World Cup, a night that's particularly significant because of the prominent role played by Māori language and culture in representing us on a global stage. We heard Māori in the breathtaking karanga, in our anthem, in our haka, in the commentary on the Reo Channel, even the French IRB president started his speech in Māori. That night provides an inkling of the point of difference that a language like Māori can offer New Zealand, a country which has yet to take seriously the economic uh, importance of languages, let alone their cultural value. My research looks at language policy and planning, how it's practiced overseas, and what it has to offer New Zealand. I find that while conventional frameworks are great at um, guiding the... Uh, well, I find that while conventional frameworks are great at guiding the technical aspects of language planning, they don't address the critical issues of power and identity that make languages so con contentious. For instance, language planners hardly even get to plan language. They mainly talk amongst themselves. Rather, it's the politicians that plan it, and generally only if there's votes in it. So unless these experts can learn to communicate persuasively to those who make decisions, they really have nothing to offer particularly to endangered or minority languages. My research draws from political discourse analysis. It identifies communicative techniques and key strategies that effectively address this problem. I use these strategies to analyse recent documents that relate to language planning in New Zealand. Some successful in attracting policy attention and changing attitudes, and some not. My findings are that language planners should First, creatively address bias and prejudice rather than ignoring it. Second, they've got to go beyond the interests of any one group, create coalitions and emphasise win-win outcomes for everyone. Third, they've got to use economic arguments before rights or treaty-based ones. Apparently politicians are swayed more by money than morals. <laughs> Last, They've got to help us imagine a different future and show us that it's feasible, viable and better than a status quo. So by the time New Zealand hosts another Rugby World Cup, I hope that political discourse strategies will be the core of language policy and planning. I hope that these strategies will have been used to encourage New Zealand to value all its languages. And last, I hope that it is our leaders and not the IRB that use Māori to greet the world. Thank you. Thank you.